Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And tonight, we bring you an STS special called Surviving My Biggest Case. And uh, I am super, as they say in California, stoked for this one. Uh, you might recognize the face. He's been on before. Uh, our best guest is retired FBI agent Greg McCrary. He entered on duty as a special agent with the FBI back on December 1st, 1969. He probably doesn't like to hear this, but I say it every time. I was about five months old back then. Uh, he'd been associated, he's been associated with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime since its inception in 1985. Uh, Greg has provided expert witness testimony in homicide and rape trials in North America and Europe. He has authored numerous publications, including The Unknown Darkness, Profiling the Predators Among Us. He did that with uh, the now famous Dr. Catherine Ramsland, who was a guest on my show at one point. Uh, and Greg was also a contributing author to the FBI's Crime Classification Manual. There are a few investigators left who uh, have the uh, makeup, the fabric of retired agent Greg McCrary. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Tell us, uh, before we get into this case you're gonna discuss, which I know nothing about, um, how did you get into the FBI? What, what made you interested in becoming a law enforcement agent? Well, it was a serendipitous, serendipitous kind of a situation. Uh, and, and actually, I, I think I, I find, actually I do find that when I talk to people, um, that it's it's kind of circumstances. In other words, there are those people who said, hey, I always wanted to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, now I am one. But that's the exception, not the rule. I think the rule is you just meet somebody, pass cross, an opportunity opens up and so forth. And that's really the way it was for me. I was out of college, I was working. I met a, uh, a uh, an agent who began to recruit me. And uh, I thought, well, I'm not sure what the FBI would want with me necessarily, but it sounds kind of cool. So uh, why not? Let's apply and see what happens. And it was then what it is now. You owe them three years if you get the appointment as an agent. Now, I think that's when I think they get their money, money's back in their investment in you for recruiting and training. And I thought, well, I can do anything for three years. If I don't like it, I'll, you know, I'll move along. And instead of quitting after three years, I, I quit after over 25. So it, uh, you know, it turned into a career. And what do you what do you think? Uh, kind of what other direction were you heading in? In other words, if you didn't meet this guy who was trying to recruit you, what what would you have done with your life? I wasn't really sure. I was out. Uh, actually, I was teaching school and in coaching some sports at the time, and it wasn't really sure. I was pretty sure I didn't want to continue with that, but wasn't sure. And then, then this just came along. So. Um, um, you know, there you go. So. It's interesting you say that. My father, who just passed recently, always said, uh, have goals, have a plan. I never had any plan. My sister, she became a doctor uh, in mm -hmm. six years. She was a doctor. She went to college for two, medical school for four. Uh, I've always been the black sheep, Greg, but I'm still. No, no, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I, I think what you have to do, I mean, that's good for those people. Great. They had a plan. They worked it. It worked out terrific. Yeah. But I think really you have to be willing to um, set aside, a, a, occasionally in a position to set aside the plan you had for your life, for the life that's waiting for you. Mm, I think that's very well put. So uh, not only do you, you know, get into the FBI, but you become one of the more, you know, heralded mm -hmm. agents, you're involved in so many different things. Um, what were those first couple of years like uh, for you uh, in mm -hmm. the agency? And how, how was it so different? Uh, back in 69, obviously technology has changed a ton, but um, were you doing a lot of like gumshoe leather uh, investigating that back then? Yeah, absolutely. I was a field agent or as we call it a brick agent. Um, you're actually hitting the bricks out there doing the day-to-day the -day, uh, work. I was first assigned to Detroit. Uh, and, uh, there I, I say I worked disorganized crime. By that, I mean bank robberies, kidnappings, extortions, that sort of thing. And then I 
was transferred to the New York office uh, in Manhattan. And there I worked organized crime, the uh, typical, what you think of, uh, the mafia, the LCN, La Cosa Nostra, mm. uh, for a number of years. And then I had a couple of other uh, assignments. I worked upstate New York for a while, and then I was out in Idaho doing uh, work against the Aryan Nations, the white the supremacist out there. And then eventually um, was recruited, transferred, and promoted to the FBI uh, Academy in the Behavioral Science Unit. And that was in the 1980s when the profiling program was in its early stages. It was We were still trying to... Um, you know, get an identity and get a, a, a focus on this. And it was a, a project under development back in the days. So I was one of the early uh, folks in on the uh, uh, on the profiling program. So do you know, uh, I assume you know Dr. Ann Burgess, who we've had, oh, yes. you know Ann well. Um, sure. And that's interesting because uh, you were an agent first because I know some agents uh, and investigators kind of take issue with some profilers and vice versa, you know, uh, you know, just thinking that maybe it's, you know, somewhat of uh, more, I, I guess, lack of a better term, a pseudoscience as opposed to investigators who are like really following evidence. But uh, how big an impact do you think profiling has had uh, on the agency? Well, it's it's had a, a large impact. I mean, when I was down there, there were, you know, seven to 12 of us, maybe max. At, mm -hmm. And now there's like 40 agents uh, doing it. And it's, it's very specialized, very compartmentalized. Uh, they have different BAUs, BAU 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, adult crimes, child crimes, threat assessment, domestic terrorism, foreign terrorism. They have it all uh, kind of divided into its specialties. But, you know, the point, what you know what I say about profiling, it's misunderstood a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the typical profiling case, uh, say if you were an investigator, detective, and you, you had a case, and I said, well, you know, you're looking for a white guy in his 30s with this kind of a criminal history or background or, you know, whatever I might say. Uh, the proper response is, uh, well, that's interesting, but but how do I catch the guy? And that's the issue. And if profiling is done uh, appropriately, the most important things we do is to provide investigative strategy and or interview strategy. It's the idea is to cut short the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the offender's career. And that comes from experience. In other words, I, I think to be a credible profiler, you got to have a lot of street time uh, out there conducting interviews. Who, how, who am I to go in and tell a police officer how best to do an interview if I've never done one or I've only done a handful? You know, you got to have the experience. And the same with investigations. I mean, to come in and make uh, credible um, suggestions as far as investigative strategy, that only comes from having done a lot of investigations. So I think the street work you, you got to earn your bones, I think, to be uh, credible in the, in the field. Well, that's interesting because I just interviewed a former FBI agent, now retired, Johnny Grusing, who, by the way, played uh, college basketball at Texas Tech. And he told me about uh, the hunt for Scott Kimball, who is a serial killer out of mm. Denver. Uh, they only have him pinned down on four murders, but they believe he's killed up to 40. And he told me uh, he called in a. Uh, an FBI profiler to do exactly that, to help him with the interviews. He said, this guy is remarkably intelligent and manipulative and would manipulate every single interview. And it would frustrate mm -hmm. him so badly because, you know, he was the FBI guy. And he said, every time he went into jail or prison to speak to him, the guy would win. So he eventually <laughs> got the profiler and uh, the profiler helped to kind of figure out uh, his narcissism and how to deal with it. So, uh, yeah. Without further ado, uh, you've obviously covered a gazillion uh, high-profile cases, but which one would you like to share today? This is one uh, that I think you, you and hopefully your, the viewers will find interesting. Um, uh, rather than give you the overview, I think I'll just jump into it. It's You're going to see it's a little bit different than the typical profiling case, but <clears throat> it's another example of some of the services we can offer. So, let me just jump into the case and uh, begin talking about the individual cases and then how this sort of came together. And and uh, feel free to jump in, ask any questions you might uh, Will do. Uh, want along the way. So it started, um, actually, I could start anywhere. But I'm going to start sort of chronologically. And we're going to begin in Prague, Czechoslovakia, in the Czech Republic. And it was uh, September 14th, 1990. 
a young woman named Blanka Bakova. She was out with her friends having drinks at uh, Wenceslas Square, which is the Tony neighborhood in, in Prague. Years ago, uh, used to be an old horse market, but now it's littered with BMWs, Mercedes, and the occasional Lamborghini. It's just the place to see and be seen mm. uh, there. And they finished their drinks, uh, and her friends were about to leave, and she said, no, she was going to stay. And they last saw her talking with uh, an attractive guy, probably around 40 years of age, and which wasn't really unusual for her. But what followed uh, was... Um, <clears throat> The next morning, her body was found about 7.30 in the morning along the uh, Latava River, which runs right through uh, Prague. And uh, it was along the banks of the river. And um, she was on her back. Uh, she had her gray stockings knotted tightly around her neck. She'd been strangled. She'd been stabbed and beaten. Body covered in dirt and leaves and grass. Clos clothing was missing. She had no uh, identification on her. And this was a real puzzlement for the Prague authorities. They hadn't had any uh, any uh, crime uh, like that uh, at all. So um, they were rather stuck on that one uh, at you know at that point. Where are you in at this time period? In I'm not involved in this case at all. You're going to see I get plugged in later. I'm just okay. kind of you know, running through the the uh, cases for you, and you're going to see how I got plugged into this uh, as we okay. get down to uh, the road. But one of the things I want to stress is the difficulty sometimes in connecting these cases uh, due to a lot of things. And you're going to see the issues involved here. So um, that's uh, a case in Prague. Now we go to Austria, uh, to Graz, and we're talking about 300 miles south of Prague. Uh, there, a street prostitute uh, um, named Brunhilde uh, Mosser just vanished. Uh, and there are going to be several cases in 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 Czech uh, in a pro, uh, excuse me in uh, Austria, and it's important to understand uh, kind of the cultural difference. Prostitution is legal uh, in Austria; um, uh, they sort of license to practice, and uh, <clears throat> it's not the uh, illegal, semi drug infested sort of activity it is uh, in, in the states. Uh, it, you know, in that regard. And maybe, I mean, arguably, no one wants their daughter necessarily to grow up to be a prostitute, but it's looked at differently over there. They're more like, I don't know, licensed practical nurses. You know, they're just out to help people and, uh, you know, whatever. They just, uh, you know, it's just a different attitude altogether. So mm -hmm. uh, anyway, um, five days later, they uh, some hikers stumbled across her body and, um uh, uh, and then the same sort of thing. She strangled and, and uh, so forth. Then um, <clears throat> uh, on March 7th, uh, shortly after that, not too long after that, uh, another prostitute vanishes from Graz. Her body's not found right away. Um, then uh, there was another murder in Bregenz over on the Swiss border and still in, uh, in Austria. So in a five-month period, uh, in 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 Austria alone, they had one woman was murdered in Bregenz, another in Graz, and a third is missing. So the Austrian authorities are beginning to look at that. These are unusual cases for them. They usually have the smoking gun, uh, domestic uh, homicide sort of thing, but these are unusual cases. So, I mean, could there be one offender doing all three? Could there be three different offenders or one offender in Graz and one in Bregenz? Or, or was the missing uh, prostitute, even a crime. Did she just run away? You know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're not quite sure what, you know, at what you're looking point, for. You know no, at this point, you know nothing about any of this because you're stateside, correct? Correct. correct. You're yeah, no, I'm, I'm not involved in this case at all at this point. Okay. So you're going to see how this this comes together here in uh, in a minute. So then suddenly after that thing we had, uh, after those crimes, there were four missing prostitutes in Vienna. Uh, in uh, again, Vienna, mellow city, coffee bars, classical music, nice place, one of the you know crime-free uh, uh, cities in the world. And, but they had four missing uh, prostitutes, no bodies, nothing, just gone. And this created quite a stir because it was so unusual. Mm -hmm. And um, 
then there was a lot of uh, lust for, uh, for public information, and that turned into kind of an orgy of media coverage. You know, what happened? What's going on? Is there a serial killer? Uh, you know what? You know what in the world is going on? And there was a uh, a, a, ju- a journalist who really stood out from the uh, pack at that point in covering the um, covering the homicides. He was out interviewing the prostitutes, interviewing the uh, police officers involved, and um, and um, doing these uh, programs on radio and television, and uh, um, it's kind of out front of everybody and. He'd interviewed the chief uh, of the Viennese uh, police, Chief Ed- Edelbacher, and uh, for uh, uh, a kind of a high-profile radio program, kind of like our NPR. And the chief at that point said, Gee, basically, we don't know. We don't have any clues. We don't even have bodies. We're not sure what's going on. And then, uh, uh, interestingly, a few days later, uh, the chief mentioned that he'd been interviewed by this reporter. His name, the reporter's name is Jack Unterweger. And uh, he mentioned that Unterweger had interviewed him, and his wife says, "Well, don't you know who he is?" And the chief said, "No, I, you know, some reporter." And he said, "No, no, no." He said, "Yeah, he's a reporter, but he's he's a convicted murderer, uh, and he's written a couple of books, and he's been paroled, and and uh, is a real um, celebrity in the uh, literate society. He's written books and plays, and wow. and, and all of that." So. Uh, Edelbacher was unaware uh, of that, and he was also unaware at that point that a retired detective from another part of uh, Austria had called in and pointed to Unterweger as a possible suspect, because he'd investigated Unterweger on the prior murders and had uh, made a case in one of them, uh, another young woman who'd been strangled with her clothing outside and left, and Jack was convicted of that. He got 15 years in prison. But then when we look at what happened with Jack during the uh, time, um, <clears throat> he not only went to prison uh, illiterate, uh, but he learned to read and write. And he developed into this award-winning uh, playwright and author and became the darling of the Viennese uh, Literate uh, uh, Society. And they petitioned for his release. And then there began to be a lot of public pressure and and stuff to get to get him out of prison. He was this. He'd been rehabilitated uh, through the arts, and you know all of that. How, how long yeah. had he served? This Jack he'd served fifteen years uh, in prison uh, yeah. for the uh, for the murder he'd done. Uh, uh, fifteen years of a life sentence. Wow. And okay. So, so now he, he's out, and he's writing and doing all this stuff, and he's living large. He's. Uh, making a lot of money. He's going to uh, book signings and play openings and uh, working as this uh, in the media as a consultant. He's uh, writing and, and doing TV and radio. He's kind of a freelancer um, out there doing a lot of this stuff. Uh, and he's also quite the womanizer. I mean, uh, um, uh, you know, when you get into Jack, you know, a friend of his says, you know, and he was going to all the high class bars and all of this uh, restaurants around the Graz. A friend of his that he acquaintance used to pal around with said Jack would walk into a bar and all the the women's underwear would just hit the floor. I mean, <laughs> the, he said Jack was screwing all of Austria, uh, and uh, so he was this you know. And, and he was convicted of of one homicide. One homicide. They had a second. They thought he might be good for, but they couldn't make the case. They didn't have the uh, have the evidence. Wow. Um, so anyway, there was Jack. He was out doing all this stuff. So the police um, began to have an interest in Jack as a potential suspect. They put a little surveillance on him, but he wasn't doing anything suspicious. They found him just doing what I'm talking about, going to the bars and restaurants and uh, hanging out with the literate you know, people and you know, doing that stuff. So they kind of dismissed him as, uh, you know, as a suspect uh, in the thing. And he came back and he interviewed Edelbacher a second time in, on June 10th of 91. And he told him he, uh, he was about to go to L.A. Um, and to do a story on prostitution in the States. And he asked the chief if uh, the chief had any uh, contacts in the LAPD. He didn't uh, necessarily. But Jack went off. Uh, he, he was in L.A. for five weeks. And um, he returned after five weeks in L.A., to find the investigation was, uh, uh, you know, picking up and beginning to to 
close in on him a little bit uh, as they were doing uh, more searches and they're getting some different information and getting a little more interested. They're kind of reviving their interest in him as a suspect. Hmm. But let's look at the L.A. thing for a minute. So um, Jack arrived in L.A. Uh, and um, the five weeks there, he did do a story on prostitution. Uh, and what he did is he went to the LAPD, introduced himself as a journalist. He got a ride along from the uh, PD. They extended the courtesy they do to foreign journalists. They gave him a ride along. And Jack was a little bit disingenuous with the cops. He's telling him uh, uh, that he was actually doing a, a writing for a police magazine because police in Austria didn't have a lot of experience or as much as the LA cops, especially in sex crimes and prostitution and those sorts of things. And so uh, he kind of enamored himself a little bit to the PD and they gave him a ride along and showed him where all the prostitutes were working and explained how it worked and in uh, uh, so forth. So uh, uh, I'm so um, uh, this is already a wild story. I mean, this is like a like a, a Bond movie. Minus right. Stuff. Exactly. <laughs> is they're thinking, um, you know, the cops are kind of dismissing. I mean. They're saying, wait a minute, uh, how could Jack, I mean, Jack is living this great life. What are the chances he's going to risk it all by going around and murdering prostitutes? I mean, what, you know, what are the chances? I mean, he's, you know, he, he's having sex with all these women anyway. I mean, yeah. uh, what, what was it? What was it in Austria? I didn't mean to interrupt, but I did. But what, what, what was it in Austria that was starting to make authorities there a little suspicious of him? Was it just his past? Uh, well, the past to a degree, but they also began doing more interviews, finding that he had had some suspicious contacts with hookers who felt uneasy and uncomfortable about him. Mm -hmm. uh, others talked about how he liked to handcuff them, and the victims had all shown restraints on their wrists and and how he liked to kind of strangle them a little bit, but not a lot. And, you mm -hmm. know, so some of the behavior was uh, bear, you know, it was parallel to what they'd seen in the homicides. And, and um, they began to, uh, you know, take a closer, uh, you know, closer, closer look at him at, at that point. So, uh, and they, they brought Jack in and told him he was a suspect. And they, they wanted his uh, alibis. So where was he during the times? Now, meanwhile, uh, they'd begin to look also at these other murders, not just the ones in Vienna, but the ones in the other uh, the other places uh, around Austria anyway at that point. So um, they uh, he gave them uh, some of his diaries and some of his travels, although he couldn't explain everything. Uh, but they did conduct a search warrant. They got enough not not to arrest, but to do a search warrant. And they got a lot of his um travel receipts and stuff because he was getting paid, uh, reimbursed for travel for some of his freelancing, but he had to keep receipts. So they got all these receipts and then they were able to actually place him uh, in the places where these murders occurred when they occurred. And then they found, for example, that uh, he was in Prague in September. So they contacted the Prague authorities. And did they have any suspicious or unsolved murders? And they, yes, exactly the night that Jack was in town, they got the Blakova murder. So mm -hmm. um, then, of course, they reached out to L.A. PD and said, during that five weeks, do you have any suspicious murders? And they said, yeah, we've got three prostitutes that were murdered that we linked them together, but we can't link them to any other crime. And we have no suspects. And they were strangled with their own bras and they were left outside and beaten. How, how uh, old is this guy Jack at this point? Uh, what, what's he look he's, like? What's this he's guy? about 40 years old. He's not a big guy, uh, but very dapper. Um, uh, not a big imposing figure, figure but um, uh, uh, just a very uh, a big persona, a, very, a guy with a lot of uh, magnetism. Uh, a very charming, outgoing, extroverted uh, kind mm. of guy who, matter of fact, a friend said, man, Jack could read, read anybody like it was crazy. He could immediately assess people and their needs and make people feel comfortable and like them and, mm. and uh, you know, all of that. And, you know, this idea, wait a minute, that Jack would be 
of killing these prostitutes and yet interviewing the cops and hanging out with cops. And, and uh, you know, he, he wished the cops good luck, hoped they could find the guy and you know, all of this. That uh, uh, So th- they had conflicted ideas, but the more they looked at him, and once they got some of these records and put him in these places, uh, then they got more than that. Um, as the investigation continued, they, um, they did the search warrant, they got the receipts, but they also got some clothing uh, from Jack because the one of the victims in uh, the Graz case had um, lots of red fibers on her body that didn't match any of her clothing. And they got a red scarf out of Jack's uh, closet. Uh, and they, they took that, they submitted that to a laboratory at the University of Bern in Switzerland. And they matched the fibers from that scarf to the fibers on the, the victim's body. Uh, they also got a, a VW that Jack had been driving when he was in Prague, searched that. They got blonde hair out of that, sent that to the lab in uh, Switzerland. They did a DNA match to that hair to the victim in Prague. So now, at this point, it really it, it's really lining up. And they get a warrant uh, for Jack. And they hit his apartment with a SWAT team, and he's gone. Uh, he he felt the the pressure. He fled, mm-hmm. and the, uh, he he had gone to Switzerland and then to France, mm-hmm. and um, uh, then he'd taken his eighteen year old girlfriend with him. He had a girlfriend uh, uh, that he had with him at the time. And uh, I'm sorry about the phone in the back. No uh, worries. Oh, sorry okay. about that. Uh, so, so Jack, uh, he fled to, uh, uh, he was with Bianca and she wanted, she wanted to go to Miami. Because, why? Because she'd seen the TV show Miami Vice and thought it looked cool. So <laughs> Miami it was. So they go to Miami, they got 1200 bucks, they get a cheap apartment. And of course, Jack being the kind of psychopathic guy he is, he doesn't work. He puts his girlfriend, his 18-year-old girlfriend, out uh, dancing at a strip bar, mm. uh, dancing, at a, dancing at a topless bar out there. Mm. Uh, so she's making some money. They're try- uh, and meanwhile, he's calling back into Austria and t- trying to cut a deal. If you drop the warrant, I'll come back. I can explain everything. Well, they're not going to drop the warrant. Mm. But there's conflict now. He has a lot of supporters in the media and the public who said, this is just the cops. They can't find the real killer. They're trying to pin it on Jack because they don't like Jack because he, you know, he survived. He, he's a survivor. He's a guy that's proof of the redemptive power of the arts, and they don't like that. And they're just trying to pin it on uh, on Jack. Plus, he's uh, get, plus he's getting all the women, and they're jealous. But yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So um, anyway, that this was kind of the dynamic that was going on um, at the time. So. Anyway, he was uh, also getting money from uh, a female acquaintance uh, in Austria. Um, and she worked for one of these media uh, companies. He'd been having an affair with her. And he'd been uh, sending her, uh, she'd been sending him money and so forth. And she kind of ran out and she went to her boss, um, who was in charge of this uh, this media uh, company, and explained what was going on and, and uh uh, said that he or the company, could they have money to support him while he was being persecuted and, you know, it was a witch hunt and all this. And he said, oh, yeah, sure, you know, I can send some money. Well, the reality was he hated Jack. <laughs> he didn't like Jack at all. And so he informed the Austrian authorities what was going on and that he, you know, that Jack was actually in Miami, which is the first time the authorities had any idea where he was and uh, that uh, he was uh, in a, uh, position to send Jack some money at this money exchange place in, uh, in Miami Beach. And uh, uh, he was willing to sort of set Jack up uh, if they were interested. And of course, they were they were quite interested uh, in uh, in doing that. But uh, it w- this was all breaking very quickly. So the, the Austrian authorities contacted Miami PD, said, hey, we got a warrant for this guy. He's going to be picking up money. Can you arrest him? And they said, We'd love to, but we can't. Uh, just on the phone call, uh, there's a whole legal process of getting extradition and getting it through the courts and making sure the warrant's valid. And 
and they just can't go and scoop the guy up. But they said, maybe the marshals, maybe the U.S. marshals can. So they contact the marshals and the marshals have the same problem. They can't go arrest him on the murder warrant without having all the proper procedures in place bureaucratically to get it, uh, get the green light. But they said they could arrest him, uh, pick him up, at least detain him long enough to, to get the warrant through the process and the serving that. They said they could pick him up because he entered on a tourist visa and he didn't declare that he was a convicted felon. So that would give them um, a reason to go scoop him up. So they went out and um, surveilled the uh, money exchange place uh, and waited. And sure enough, Jack and his girlfriend show up and she goes in to get the money and Jack, they, they think Jack makes them. They're about five big burly marshals uh, mm-hmm. hanging around across the street. And uh, um, Jack, uh, uh, they're pretty sure Jack had made them. And it, they made Jack pretty quickly. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, she comes out with the money and they they make their move. Uh, they One one marshal grabs her. She doesn't run. She has no idea really what's going on. Mm-hmm. Jack takes off and it's uh, the scene's like out of a... a, a um, you know, a grade B movie. I mean, he, he runs into a restaurant, through the restaurant, through the kitchen, knocking over pots and pans and waitresses. And the marshals are in hot pursuit, you know, through the restaurant and out the back and so forth. Well, they get him. That doesn't take long. They run him down and, and um, uh, you know, get him locked up. So uh, <clears throat> um, they take Bianca back to the apartment. They let her go. No reason to. That's the girlfriend. Uh, they let her go. There's no warrant. There's no problem. She didn't come into the country illegally. There's no warrant for her. So they kind of leave her there. But Jack is held, obviously. And then the uh, um, once they pick him up, then uh, all the other legal process gets in place. Uh, And initially, the Miami uh, or the uh, L.A. cops um, come out to interview uh, Jack as he's being held in Miami. Jack is fighting extradition. He doesn't want to go back. So he's there. And so the L.A. cops come out uh, to interview him about the murders uh, there. And uh, once Jack learns that uh, uh, the uh, that California has a death penalty, the gas chamber in Austria has no death penalty. He decides he no longer wants to waive extradition. He wants to go back to Austria (laughs) rather than take the chance of ended up in uh, California and facing the uh, gas chamber out there. Wow. So, uh, so he does. So Jack is uh, extradited back to Austria uh, to face uh, face charges there. Now, what what's interesting about this is we get into the law and the differences in the law mm-hmm. um, in Austria. Uh, now, well, let me say here in the states we have venue, right? Mm-hmm. In other words, a person has to be tried in in the place where the crimes occurred. He would be tried in L.A. for the L.A. cases. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just like if he say if he'd murdered someplace else in the States, he'd he'd have to be tried in that jurisdiction. Well, um, Austria has a much broader view uh, of that. Their law is that an Austrian citizen can be tried for a crime uh, no matter where he commits it uh, in the Austrian courts. In other words, the Austrian courts can hold an Austrian uh, citizen responsible for his crimes wherever he commits them. So. They could take the L.A. cases. They could take the Austrian cases, obviously, as well as the Prague case. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he could be tried for all 11 of these homicides in Austria. So everybody agrees, at least from the law enforcement side, that's a good deal. So so um, they decide they're going to charge Jack with all of the uh, um, all of the crimes uh, in uh, in Austria. So uh, it's at this point. I first get involved. No, I didn't know any of that um, uh, when I first got involved. I got a call from our legal attache in Vienna. Uh, I say we call legat or legal attache. Uh, We have agents in every embassy. uh, And the idea is to liaison with the foreign governments when we have international crimes so that we can, you know, further the uh, liaison and the cooperation and work collectively to collaboratively on uh, any matters uh, of mutual interest. So anyway, I get a call from our legat in Vienna and he says, hey, they've got a serial murder case here. They think first one they've ever had um, and they're looking for all the help they can get. 
and uh, they think they've got the right guy, the cases, but they want to know if you know there's anything we could do to be helpful. And um, I said, yeah, I mean, I, I I think so. I'd be happy to look at the cases. And and um, you know, I, I said my as initial assessment. I said I think what I could be most helpful with is determining if we can do a signature crime analysis. In other words, can we link these crimes together based on the behavioral and physical evidence? And, um, and where, are you, where are you physically at this point? I'm at Quantico, uh, Quantico in the Behavioral okay. Science Unit. Yep. Okay. Okay. And uh, so that's that's what they call. We've got the expertise in serial murder in, mm. in the Behavioral Science Unit there. So, so I so I say, yeah, have them come over. Uh, they send their two lead investigators over uh, with all the cases. Uh, I spend two weeks uh, with them, and I say, have them separate the case files from the suspect. I said, I want to start this like a profiling project from the ground up. I don't want to know anything about the suspect. I want to start with the cases, look at all the cases, see if I think there's a common link between them. And then I can quote unquote profile the offender. We can overlay the profile on their suspect. Is he a good fit or not? And then, you know, we'll, we'll just see where this goes. So they came over, uh, let me stop you there for one sec, just so I make sure I understand this. So in other words, you want to just know who these victims are, how they were murdered, where they were murdered, the method of murder, all that, and, exactly. and see what links all of these murders together without even knowing. You didn't want to know anything about the guy who may have perpetrated the crime. That's right. I didn't okay. want to bias my analysis. I wanted it to be as objective as okay. possible. Okay. So I didn't want any suspect information. I just wanted the crimes. Mm -hmm. And then we could work from there. Once I'd done that analysis and come up with my sort of profile, then we could then compare that with a suspect and what they had that linked him to the crimes. And then we could see where we could go from there. So, uh, so they came over and that's what we did. Uh, now, what we did specifically is uh, I took the LA cases, looked at those, and obviously the um, um, Prague of uh, the uh, Prague case and the all the Austrian cases, and we put them in the computer program that we have uh, at at the FBI called the acronym is VICAP V I C A P. It's the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, and the purpose of that is to link crimes together. In other words. Uh, it's designed primarily here for the states. Uh, we have over 18,000 police agencies. How does one police agency know to talk to another if there's a transient offender? Uh, the idea is uh, police put in um, solved, both solved and unsolved cases, and the computer analyzes those things and looks for commonalities. And they'll kick out, say, the 10 most common cases. They may not be link very good at all, but they'll find the best they can. And then one of our anal our analysts will go over that. And if there's enough uh, there, really substance to look at, they may, they'll call, say, hypothetically, uh, the Biloxi, Mississippi Police Department and say, you need to talk to the Kalamazoo, Michigan Police Department, uh, because the gun uh, that was used in both these murders is the same gun. So you got something in common or, or whatever the link may be. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea. So I said, uh, I looked at these cases and based on the totality of the circumstances, I thought there's strong likelihood uh, that, that they were linked. But I said, let's put it in the computer system and see what we get. And there are um, well over at that time, probably 10, 12,000 cases in there. And the computer linked these 11 cases but they only linked them to one other case, which surprised me. I thought we'd have probably multiple cases that would be close enough, but I put in like 15 different variables and did this in hoc, uh, ad hoc search. And uh, we came up with just one other case and that was solved and it was a legitimately solved case. And so we're really linked with the, left with these 11 cases that linked to themselves to each other, but, um, uh, we eliminated thousands and thousands of other cases. So that, uh, from a statistical point of view, was was very strong. Now, these in, Vi in VICAP, is it just uh, domestic cases that you're looking at? Uh, it is uh, at that point. We just had U.S. cases. Okay. Um, uh, other 
So you're like looking to see if you can link cases in LA, I guess. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We had the LA cases. They didn't link to anything else in the States um, mm-hmm. other than the one case that was solved and, and you know, it wasn't that close to like, Anyway, mm-hmm. well, now there's more there's more going on uh, in the lab that's linking these cases uh, together. And that is um, that what's happened uh, is there's a, an analyst uh, in L.A. in the lab who uh, looked at the evidence and said uh, of the three victims that were strangled, they were strangled with their bra and the knots were tied in exactly the same way. So that's a piece of behavioral evidence, if you will, or circumstantial evidence, behavioral evidence that linked them together. They were tied in an intricate knot, but all, uh, all the same way. Well, then they compared those knots with the ones uh, that they had in uh, Austria, and they were tied in the same way. So now this is really coming together um, as far as being able to link these uh, link these cases together. So what I did, um, I did, I wrote a report, a signature crime analysis as to why these crimes were linked. Uh, I didn't mention anything about a suspect, uh, anything about that. This was just a crime analysis. Uh, and I linked these crimes together. And I, uh, this is what we call a signature crime uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, the, the trick is uh, then that we had to then uh, or w- once we got to trial to show why Jack would be a good suspect, that, you know, in, in the case. But that was a little bit beyond, uh, you know, what I was tasked to do. So um, I submitted the report and uh, this thing then went to trial in, in Austria. So I went over to testify. I testified in, in the in the trial and um based on uh, uh, that signature crime report. Now, what was also interesting about the different legal system is I called a legat. I said, hey, I'm coming over. Make sure I have time to meet with the prosecutor, which is what we do here in the States all the time to prepare my testimony. Make sure they're going to ask me the right questions so that I can you know, get out the answers that, that, that I want to get out. Well, I, I learned, I <laughs> found I was told by the league at in Vienna that mm, that that's not going to happen. That's uh, that's illegal. They don't do that in Austria. In other words, no one gets an advance crack at any witness until you get on the stand. So it's it's quite different than our system here. It's also different because it's an inquisitional system rather than an adversarial system. In other words, they have a jury, but they have three judges. So there are three judges on the stand mm-hmm. and the questioning begins with the judges. Uh, which is you know quite different than here in the uh, in the states. Uh, it goes from the judges to the prosecutor uh, to the defense attorney, and then maybe redirect or recross or whatever. Uh, so anyway, I show up. I'm toward the end of the trial uh, as they they, they want to get all the evidence in on the cases, and then have me come in and and link these cases uh, together through the the analysis. How so, many murders at this point uh, when he goes to trial? How many murders is he being charged with? 11. 11. Okay. 11. Yep. He's got the three in LA, uh, the one in uh, Prague, and then seven in Austria. Wow. Okay. So my job was twofold uh, educate the jury about the signature aspect of crime analysis, and uh, then obviously, uh, specifically, how these uh, crimes were uh, linked. So, um, uh, so I did. I explained the methodology. Uh, how I use the VICAP system and how that linked the cases together statistically. And we eliminated thousands of other cases. And, and then, um, you know, how the knots were tied all the same way and, and um, all these uh, variables that linked these cases together, but excluded thousands of other cases. And basically why I thought, uh, you know, these cases were linked together. So um, then on cross-exam, uh, it, it, it was interesting. Uh, they, they tried their best to obviously undermine uh, my testimony. And for example, they said, well, wait a minute, there are differences here. The U.S. victims were strangled with their bras, but none of the European victims were strangled with their bras. And my answer to that was that that was because uh, the European, the prostitutes and European victims didn't wear bras. Uh, the, but they were strangled with their own undergarments. So that was the 
the con the consistency was the victims were each strangled with their own undergarments, whether it was were, a bra. Were the knots still the same? Were the knots always? Yeah, the knots were always the same. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so that's very compelling uh, uh, evidence. Uh, and, and then the other the other thing that, that didn't go well, I don't think, for the defense was, uh, th and they were going along the line of uh, that Jack was having consensual sex with all these women, and um, why in the world would he be going to prostitutes when he, you know, didn't have to? And they they said, have you ever had a case like this, where a, you know a guy was having consensual sex? and then went out and killed prostitutes uh, at the same time. And, you know, it's an example that, you know, there's that adage among lawyers anyway, that, you know, you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. <laughs> well, they'd asked me the question and I said, oh yeah, absolutely. I, I had a case very, very much like this. Um, and this was a case of Rochester. I said, yeah, the uh, uh, serial killer there had done murders, had uh, done uh, 15 years in prison, came out and murdered 11 prostitutes all the time. He was married and had a girlfriend having a lot of consensual sex. So, yeah, I mean, these things happen. It's not, you know, not that. Uh, Let's uh, just pause know, there for one second, so, just from so people understand this a little bit better. Yeah. Uh, going inside the killer's mind, like this guy, Jack Untervator, it's not about the sex, right? So what um, for him, what was it all about? It's about the anger. Uh, he's. Um, He's just angry, uh, uh, angry at women. He's a sec he was diagnosed correctly by the prison authorities in Austria way back at the beginning as a sexual psychopath, um, hated women. Um, uh, and uh, his mother was a prostitute. Well, how much that had to do with it, mm. you know, we could we can talk. But um, but he hated women, ha hated, hated the sexual aspect. You talk about anger, uh, the strangling of these victims. Um, for, for example, in L.A., uh, one victim, her neck, uh, the circumference was six inches uh, once, uh, you know, he'd strangled her. Uh, six, seven and nine inches. That's that's how tight and how uh, how tightly he'd strangled, how much force he'd used, how much anger. They'd been beaten and stabbed. And clearly he was uh, and again. I apologize. For no, no worries. So in he, the background. Would he stab them first and then strangle? Was it always the same M.O.? Uh, it was beaten, uh, stabbed, and strangled, and it's hard to know the exact sequence. It looked like he may have strangled them first because there didn't seem to be a lot of defense wounds. Uh, there were some, but he may have beaten and strangled them, and uh, then done some stabbing, um, you know, at the end. So that's that's pretty much what it, uh, you know, what it uh, looked like. Did, now, did you it, ever interview him? Well, no, no, I didn't, and I wanted to. And let me just finish the story quickly. We're, we're getting near the end here. But yeah. during during the break, uh, there's a morning break in my testimony. And much to my surprise, Jack kind of bolted up. He was sitting off to my left behind me. And he kind of jumped out of the chair and came up and wanted to correct my testimony, being, being who Jack was. Uh, uh, he, he said the first that first murder he'd been convicted for, the victim, Margaret Schaefer, he said, that was not a sexual homicide. And I said, well, that one wasn't. But and then are you telling me the, the others were? And then he realized he'd kind of walked himself into a trap there with, with, with that question. And by then, the guards had grabbed him and, and you know, and, and, and pulled him back. Um, obviously, he wasn't supposed to be up there uh, talking to me about, uh, uh, you know, about my testimony. Um, anyway. Um, so Jack uh, was ultimately convicted of nine of the 11, uh, which I thought was a very good verdict. Um, uh, I say a good verdict. The two that the uh, jury didn't convict him on were two of the Austrian cases where there were just skeletal remains, and we couldn't say for sure they had died of ligature strangulation, even though their clothing was tied in a knot and was near the body. There was, it couldn't be proved conclusively that they died of manual strangulation or ligature strangulation. So they gave him a pass on the two. But I felt vindicated because the signature crime analysis worked. They, they linked the Prague crime, the L.A. crimes and uh, five of the seven um, Austrian crimes uh, together. Now, Jack, uh, within six hours of being convicted, uh, Jack uh, hung himself in his cell, committed suicide. 
Uh, and he tied the knot in the same way that he had <sighs> tied the other knots. And some some say that uh, that was his best murder uh, at, of all. So that's basically the story. Um, wow, what a crazy ending right there. So yeah. um, obviously different laws. I mean, in the States, they may have uh, just put him in like a, you know, in a paper mache uh, jumpsuit for a while. But uh, there he went in his clothing. And uh, do you know what he used to hang himself? Yes, he did. He had a, a like a jogging suit on and he used uh, there was a, a thin cord around the pants and he used that to loop around uh, the bed in the cell and then around his neck. And we call it incomplete partial suspension. He got on his knees, knelt down and enough till he passed out. And then of course he slumped down and then, um, you know, there, it turned into uh, a fatal uh, uh, strangulation. So that's, that's what, that's what happened. Um, kind of the moral of the story, you know, when I tell the story, uh, you know, uh, I say, you know, Jackson example, you, what you get, uh, or I could ask the hypothetical question, what do you get when you educate a psychopath? The answer is, you get an educated psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> Not redeemable. So. Wow. Um, do you believe that he killed more than the uh, 11 that are out yes. there? Yeah. Yeah. We had journal articles uh, that he kept, and he, he was talking about Romania. And we, we, we could never link him directly to any murders in, in Romania uh, uh, at the time. But we think there were more. Uh, but the 11 were the ones we had, you know, really good, good evidence on that. I, I suspect I suspect he did others as well. Yeah. When, when he approached you during the trial, um, mm -hmm. it's funny because I was just watching a true crime show and it was a. Uh, a European trial and something similar happened. Mm. Uh, do you have any fear or trepidation he was going to go after you right then and there? No, no, not at all. Jack, it was, uh, I, I never was scared of the guy. I mean, he came in the courtroom and you could see, I mean, he was, he's a persona. I, 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 I referred to him as a malevolent thoroughbred. I mean, he was <laughs> a classy guy, but, um, um, uh, you know, it's hard to exchange. He just had this big persona that really filled the courtroom, even yeah. though he was this guy with small stature. Yeah. But being the narcissistic psychopath he was, he was he was just coming up to explain how my testimony was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting back without analyzing too much, but do you yeah. think do you think it was his mother being a prostitute at a young age that triggered this anger and hatred for the prostitutes and? Yeah, I, I think so. Without getting too, uh, you know, into the weeds on this, I, I think there was something there. But then we get into this issue of <clears throat> psychopathy. And is it, you know, is it, uh, I call it a nature nurture tango. Is it part of the upbringing or is it part of the nature? And the, the, the answer, it's a well, a not well understood combination of both those things. So mm -hmm. I certainly think that environment could be part of what led to this for sure. Yeah. And uh, I guess my last final question, if he did not hang himself that day and somehow got out of prison, you think he would have uh, definitely been a repeat offender? Uh, I think so. I think he would have been much more cautious. Uh, again, I, I just don't think, you know, one of these guys we interviewed as part of our research, uh, I think was very honest with us. He, he said, you know, I don't, he's in prison. He said, I don't feel the urge to do it, but I know if I got out, I'd do it again. Um, so I think that's, that's it. And, you know, Jack is sort of like um, the, the Shawcross case I mentioned. These guys did 15 years. Now, Shawcross didn't, you know, become an educated playwright or anything. But when I talk to parole and probation people, I say, look, these guys tend to be model prisoners. They, you know, they get along OK in prison because what they want to do is rape and murder women and children. There are no women and children to rape or murder in prison. So, they're otherwise well behaved, but that doesn't mean they're okay to release back into society. Wow. Um, so you've been, you know, around a lot of different serial killers. Is, is there a way? Is there a single kind of common denominator among all these uh, offenders? Uh, it's difficult to say. Um, there's no, you know, some people say, well, it, what's the profile of a serial killer? And I say, well, there really is no one. Uh, some like Jack can have a sexual component to them. Uh, others, not so much a sexual component. They can murder for, for different reasons. Um, 
uh, I would say if there's any trait, it would be more of these psychopathic tendencies where there's no guilt, no remorse, no empathy for the victims. There may be different motivations, underlying motivations, and it's usually a, uh, a complicated cocktail of emotions that uh, um, you know, drive them and uh, motivate them to do this. Some can be more heavy on the sexual side, uh, others uh, maybe not so much, maybe more on the anger, or where the anger becomes eroticized. It can it can be it can be more complicated, but I would say more. If there's any one thing, it would be the characteristics and traits of psychopathy would be a, a common factor. And I presume that he hanged himself not because he felt uh, empathy or remorse for his victims, but he felt sorry for himself that he was now stuck in prison. Yeah, it was. If I may say so bluntly, it's it's the last fuck you to society. He wasn't going to let us control the rest of his life. That's the only thing he had left that he had control over, and he took it. He wasn't going to give it to us. He wasn't going to give us the privilege of knowing he's rotting away in prison. How do you feel that moment when you got that news? Uh, actually, it was interesting. Uh, I talked to them about the potential for Jack committing suicide, but, but I still was a little bit taken aback that he'd done it so quickly. I mean... You were I still in the country, that, right? Or you were... It was... I don't know if you're still there, but you yeah, no, I'd left. I'd, I'd gotten back. And uh, uh, I matter of fact, I got the call that he'd been convicted. And within hours, I got the second call that he was dead uh, in which it, it's a, you know, I thought he might try appeals or he might, uh, you know, try to, you know, worm his way out of this somehow legally. And then maybe if there was no no chance, he might do that. But but to do it within six hours, uh, I was surprised at that. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you just witnessed uh, an STS special called Surviving My Biggest Case with our best guest, uh, Agent Greg McCrary, retired from the FBI, but he started there as a special agent on December 1st, 1969. Uh, he's been associated with the National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime, otherwise known as the NCAVC, since its inception in 85. Uh, and as you heard, he's given witness uh, testimony in homicide and rape trials in North America uh, and Europe, and he's the author of The Unknown Darkness, Profiling the Predators Among Us. More importantly, uh, he is a interesting, cool man, and uh, appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, Greg, we'll get you back on uh, soon enough, and uh, thank you for your service to the country. Uh, you're very welcome. Thanks for the opportunity, and thanks for the opportunity of being on. Hope you enjoyed it. Love you, America. Love you, Virginia. Love you, L.A. Love you, Austria. And everywhere far in between.